ESPN celebrating 150 years of college football. Sports TV is a live event, and you can't script it. So it's basically unscripted reality. Touchdown! Oh, Part of that, of course, becomes the broadcasters. Brady, nice play fix. Sets up, fires across the middle. His tight end's got it. Sean Thompson, touchdown! Just like that. Well, in college football, there's plenty of great broadcasters out there. Touchdown, Auburn! What makes them great? Well, it just depends on where they are. Touchdown! Touchdown! Great sports writing offers the most entertaining extension of sports there is. I think objective journalism is, you know, a thing of the past. You better have passion because the game is overflowing with passion. I need to hear it in your voice. He's going for the corner. He's got it. Vince Young scores. Presented by Xfinity. Guys, I want to thank all of you for coming here on the anniversary of college football. 150 years, and we're celebrating the game that means so much to all of us. I can't think of another sport that encourages as much civil and sometimes not so civil discussion and debate and discourse <laughs> as college football. I'm hoping most of this will be civil, but if you want to get uncivil every now and then, that might make it fun. So I want you guys to think of us as a jury. And since there are 11 of us, let's come up with top 11 and a number of categories. Everybody gathered here at this prestigious table loves to talk about college football. And there are actually one or two of you willing to listen to others talk about college football from time <laughs> to time, too. All of us have really strong opinions, but I do think that there are voices in this sport who connect us to the game. So as we figure out the greatest of the great, Let's get the 11 greatest voices in college football. Oh, you're Mr. Rice, Mr. Granlin Rice. Might recognize you anywhere. Granlin Rice was the first great myth maker of sports writers. This ought to be one of the greatest football seasons we've ever had. He comes up with the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame, which is obviously his most famous creation. Granlin Rice talked about the Four Horsemen. You know, outlawed under a blue gray sky. <laughs> Four horsemen rode again. He really had more to do with creating those myths than anyone who ever lived. Here's to our rock, to our friend and our pal. You know, my dad, Dan Jenkins, is really the, f the first person who explained to Sports Illustrated that it was worthwhile to start tracking the race for number one and the race for a national champion, that there was an enormous appetite for that sort of coverage. There's nothing more arrogant than writing. By somebody, I'm gonna now tell you about this. You better know what you're talking about. It was pretty easy to know when you were reading a Dan Jenkins story because, you know, every two or three paragraphs, you'd burst out laughing. You have to write what you know. I just wrote about what I knew and what I thought I knew and exaggerated it all. He has such a snide, smart aleck voice that took down the people that needed to be taken down. He loved college football passionately even after he quit covering it in the early 70s. Cut. And we come up, and we hit him shy on the 16-yard line, and we've stopped him, and we have won this thing in overtime. I will argue until my final day on Earth that the Georgia announcer, Larry Munson, was the best three hours you could ever spend. He didn't make any bones about being a Georgia fan. I think it's over. They can't get a playoff. We saved ourselves. No, we didn't. All 80 Lux saved us. Even though I didn't grow up a Georgia fan, Larry Munson was my favorite because he was completely on Georgia's side. Now he's running over people. Herschel, oh, you Herschel Walker. He's as excited as you are. Going to throw on a run, complete to the 25, to the 30. Lindsey's got 35, 40. Lindsey's got 45, 50, 45, 40. Run, Lindsey. 25, 20, 50, 10, 5. Lindsey's got. Lindsey's got.
It must be an amazing privilege to be associated with one school for a long time. We just stepped on their face with a hot nail boot and broke their nose. I mean, you're an icon. Believe it or not, for our younger members of the jury here, <laughs> there was a time. There was a Where? time before Ivan. There was a <laughs> <laughs> That's just not nice, Maria. That's targeting 15 <laughs> yards, Maria Taylor, and an ejection. <laughs> But there was a time when really the televised game was rare and your connection to college football came through the pros of the great writers and the eloquence of the radio voices. Well, Grantland Rice, for me as a young journalism student covering sports, when you were looking at old sports stories or how you did your job, that was who we looked up to was Grantland Rice. And I imagine for the writers in the room, that was someone that you looked up to. It was your time, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> but Grant and Rice was a rock star of the first half of the 20th century. I mean, he determined a sporting event. Uh, you know, if he went and covered it, it became a big deal. Well, I, I grew up on the West Coast, and I didn't have the pleasure of listening to Larry Munson on a regular basis, but I sure got those highlights. And with his voice, I was like, they broadcast football a little differently in the SEC. I think, <laughs> I, think I like it. <laughs> that, that's the that's great thing about a, a voice like Larry Munson. You may not know his name, but for me, you grew up in the Northeast. Oh, yeah, that's the Hobdale Boot guy you tell your friend. And, exactly. Oh, oh yeah, the, the Run Lindsay Run. And you knew who the guy, even if you didn't know his name, you knew his voice and you knew what he'd said. What's a Hobnail Boot? It doesn't matter. I don't even know. <laughs> I know what a hobnail boot is. In my mind, I can see it. Mm -hmm. It's like a red and black boot that you step on Tennessee's face with. <laughs> <laughs> but, but traveling the country, my favorite thing to do, like when you roll into town to do a, a college game on Saturday, is hit the AM dial Friday night listening to high school football. I can identify immediately who the radio legend was because it, it, he's mimicked. Well, speaking of mimicking, you know, every writer of my generation tried to mimic Dan Jenkins <laughs> in Sports Illustrated and failed miserably, miserably because he was such an incredible, singular, entertaining, hilarious voice, and the man loved college football. To me, and I got to know Dan as I got older, the um, great contribution was making sports journalism elegant. Like, I'm going into this field now that's an elegant field. So that's what Grant and Rice and Dan Jenkins to me is what they did for our industry. The Greatest, presented by Xfinity. Take your Wi-Fi to the next level. Get speed, coverage, and control with Xfinity XFi. And as the ability to televise more games came along, there were voices which became synonymous with college football on Saturday afternoons. Or Sunday mornings. I grew up a Notre Dame fan, lived outside of South Bend, and I can remember getting up every Sunday morning, grabbing the South Bend Tribune, and then turning on Lindsey Nelson to see the highlights. I mean, it was where you watched Notre Dame. Era Parsegian is the first non-Notre Dame graduate to coach the Fighting Irish in recent years. His teams have featured imaginative offenses. When I was in school, every Sunday morning, we'd watch Lindsey Nelson narrate the Notre Dame game. Notre Dame is up 27-6, opportunity for Purdue to make a play. I mean, we used to lay there and watch that. You know, if you go back to Lindsey Nelson and these guys that were iconic, you know, he was telling stories and he, he had lots of time. It really drew us to these old famous play-by-play -play guys. All those young people out there say, hey, Lindsey Nelson, I want to grow up to be just like you. What do you tell them? Well, if you're going to be a broadcaster, broadcast wherever you can. Hewitt goes for broke. His pass is complete to Jack Snow in the end zone, and Notre Dame goes ahead 10 to nothing. Tell him I can hear. Tell him I can hear this. One of the more powerful forces in the history of television as it pertains to college football was Beano Cook. I can hear Fowler. What are we getting Beano Cook now? Beano had such a great understanding of the sport. Can Doug Flutie play professional football? Is he too small? Well, they said Napoleon was too small. He didn't really have the traditional perch. He didn't call games. He was not an analyst in the booth. Silly! But Bino became this ubiquitous voice, and he had such a great way of putting things, people wanted to know what he thought. It's very simple. You can be God, but if you don't win, you're fired. He was college game day before college game day started. 
because he was not football, per se, as football analysts. He had a sense of humor, and it was very good. Oh, this is broken, but so are my picks. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vern Lundquist. Not a bad scene, is it? Vern Lundquist was a great voice for the SEC. And that's what's, I think, neat about college football is that certain voices are associated with leagues and regions. One step in the end zone. It's tipped up. It's caught. It is caught. Javon James. The Vern Lundquist was good at keeping quiet at the moment. Broadcasters understand they are there to enhance the show. They are not the show. No. Return by Chris Davis. Davis goes left. Davis gets a block. Davis has another block. Touchdown and answered prayer. I'm an SEC girl. I mean, 3.30 Gator game, Vern's calling that game with that big chuckle and that smile and the oh my. My, oh my. Oh gosh, get me all excited here, yeah. Oh, jump pass. How about that? great friend Vern Lundquist is not in this booth today. I'm going to try to do it with the same class that Vern did for 17 seasons. Brad Messler gets excited. He sounds like whatever game it is, it's the only game, it's the best game, it's the biggest game. He's a guy everybody in the South knows. He's done college football both for ESPN and for CBS forever, so it was not like he's an unknown commodity. Brady, nice play fix. Sets up, fires across the middle. His tight end's got it. Sean Thompson, touchdown! Just like that. Brad Nessler is a great voice because he's got that resonate like I gargle with scotch. And I think he's a great announcer. Ezekiel Elliott. And he's got an opening. Elliott! Off to the races. Can they catch him? No, they can't. Touchdown. I was born outside of Pittsburgh, and so one of my first voices in college football was Bino. Mm. And I remember my high school journalism teacher getting his autograph and bringing it back to our, our little newspaper room in the high school, being like, look what I got you. And it was Bino's autograph. I can remember tuning for the college football game at ABC, not necessarily just to see the game, but to see what he was going to say at halftime when they're running through all the scores and the highlights. Well, and if you've ever worked at ESPN, and certainly if you've ever worked at it as long as some of us have, you hear Bino's name, and the only thing you think of is, tell him I can hear him. Tell him I can tell hear him. him, can hear him. <laughs> still, the greatest, still the greatest outtake will always be the greatest outtake in ESPN history. <laughs> what about Vern? whose rise and connection with college football coincided with the growth of the SEC. The reason why you know that everyone loved him is we probably had like three or four games that year where we were in the same place as Vern Lundquist when he was going on his farewell tour. And he would have like an eight minute no ode question. to Vern, Georgia did it, LSU did it, yep. you know, the 80 oh, shot Vern. coming through to say thanks Vern for all you've yeah. done for the SEC. He's I mean, well loved. Yeah, yeah, farewell tour and was that, phenomenal. He's he like big, he big papa, that, yeah. like he's like granddad. Yeah. Like, Who do you pick to replace him? I mean, Red Nestler. <laughs> so I'm biased on Brad because I worked with him for many years doing college football. And to me, Brad is a minimalist at play-by-play. -play. He doesn't get in the way of the game. He enhances everything. And I think he is one of the great underappreciated MVP play-by-play. -play. Yeah. He used to be before he made this list. <laughs> <laughs> now he's appreciated. The Rose Bowl Stadium, if a place carries that type of significance in the sport, then the voice who brings that particular game to you sort of has a category unto itself, sort of the granddaddy voices of the granddaddy of them all. It may be a bit chilly for Californians, but it's an ideal day for football at that temperature anywhere in America. Kurt Gowdy, Al DeRogatis, Happy New Year, everybody. Kirk Gowdy's voice was iconic in part because he was one of the first great television sports voices. So that was the first one we heard. I'm Kurt Gowdy, this is Paul Crispin. The fall with this beautiful weather today, both teams have good passers. NBC Sports presents a look at the 1975 Rose Bowl game. He covered every sport there was and was always good at it, and he became known for the Rose Bowl. Breaks away to the 
look at broadcasting the Rose Bowl. It's in Wikipedia who broadcasts the Rose Bowl, how many times they broadcast the Rose Bowl, how many Rose Bowl games Dick Enberg called. Happy New Year, everyone. Dick Enberg, and I'm privileged to be here. My first Rose Bowl game. It's kind of cool to see your name in that list. Plays are going long. Dick Enberg was just such a pro. You know, he was enthusiastic without being a cheerleader. You wanted to spend time with him talking to you about the game that you were watching together. You are looking live at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. Brent was the first time I was going to work with somebody that I watched as a kid. He was a legend. And welcome. I'm Brent Musburger. When he would say, you're looking live. I would just be like a fan sitting at home. I just happened to be standing next to him about to call the game. Run for the first down. Mendenhall breaks it. Got a wide receiver out in front to block for it. Touchdown, Atlanta. Brent has the ability to make it feel big, and it still comes across as authentic. Throws it down. Brett Musburger's Hail Flutie, to me, is everything that a great college football call should be. Now, you have to have the moment, but it wasn't just the moment. It was Brett recognizing the moment. He threw it into the end zone. There was no time left on the clock. Brent was great at a lot of different things for a lot of years. He doesn't feel like a guy who's artificially hyping something. It just comes naturally for him. So he was a great fit in broadcasting those big college games on ABC. And he steps up, throws, has a man open. Keith Jackson was more than just describing the action. Preston heading for the corner. Touchdown. It was Americana. It was going back to what makes college football special to a lot of us. It's traditional. Framed by the San Gabriel Mountains, this is the city of Pasadena, California, site of one of the world's great festivals on this day, the Tournament of Roses. Keith's describing the game, and he's doing it in such a folksy way that that's what made him unique, and that's what made him the best. When there was a big play in a game, whoa, Nelly! Touchdown, Buckeyes! Whoa, Nelly! Oh, Nelly! <laughs> it was absolutely fitting that the final game that Keith Jackson, the voice of college football, covered was the Rose Bowl in 2006 at the granddaddy of them all. He's going for the corner! He's got it! No script writer in the history of Hollywood will ever write a better script than that Rose Bowl. Well, it's just to me, it's about our job as writers, broadcasters, whatever is, the folks that can't be there with us, let's get them in the stadium. Let, let, let's get them in the press box. Let's get them on the sideline. And these are the guys, all the names on this list, that took me sitting in my living room in North Carolina to the Rose Bowl. And they were the perfect voices to take you there. Keith Jackson, I mean, he's someone who is the voice of the Rose Bowl. If it was a big game, you heard his voice, and he had a certain grace and elegance with his call as well. He's the voice of our childhood for me, but in this really crazy miracle, I got to work his last game at the Rose Bowl. And I remember doing some pregame hits. Um, the first time I had to toss it back to the booth, I was panicked, and I said, Back to you, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> because how does a little girl grow up listening to him and then toss it back elegantly? So they're like, please don't call him Mr. Jackson. But I was like, I can't be like, Keith. Are we, are we overlooking a Kurt Gowdy, a Dick Enberg, for all those years, you know, they did the Rose Bowl and the like because we're much closer in the moment to Keith Jackson? Well, we have to remember about Kurt Gowdy is as TV expanded in the country and as color TV expanded in the country way back in the day, as more and more people watch the Rose Bowl, he was the guy. You know, he was the play-by-play -play voice, and, and it's an uh, integral part of college football in the 60s and 70s. The thing with Dick Enberg, when you heard his voice, you knew it was a big event, but he never felt that way. He's like, how could I possibly be associated with this? There was a genuine humility. Yeah, but the thing for me, and then it's probably because I'm younger, but, you know, when I think of Gowdy, I think of baseball. For some reason, when I think of Enberg, I think of tennis. Mm -hmm. Keith Jackson, right, yeah. college football. And I know he did he did other things, mm -hmm. but 
but I think of Keith Jackson just See, college football. Brent, Brent too. For yeah. me, it's Brent. Brent called the national championship I played in, and I remember going to New Orleans and finding out that Brent was on the call, and I was telling my teammates, like, Brent Musburger about to call out game. It's like I ascended to a different level. Funny story, too, about Brent. I remember one time we were, like, making the great escape from a game, and we go to, like, cookout because we're in the South somewhere, and we just want hamburgers and hot dogs, and it's the only thing still open. And we pull up, we grab the bags. There's an actual driver who takes everything, and Brent's in the passenger seat, and he's like, thank you so much, laddie. And the guy looks over, <laughs> and he goes, is that Brent Musburger? And we're like, yes, you're looking live. <laughs> you are looking live. There's an evolution of the voice of college football. Steve's on the move. Weston heading for the corner. Touchdown. Keith Jackson couldn't be Dick Enber or Kurt Gowdy or Lindsey Nelson or some of the first generation legendary TV voices. You don't want people to come out of a factory and one guy sounds like the next. And the guys who have been the preeminent voices of college football have been very unique personalities and very authentic personalities. And that's the beauty of it. It's been my privilege to sit by your side for 11 years. Thanks. We really appreciate all the things that you've done for college football and wish you the very best in your retirement. The wait is over. Here are the 11 greatest voices of the first 150 years of college football. You have to write what you know. If you don't like it, turn the page. Sets up, fires across the middle, his tight end's got it, Sean Thompson, touchdown! Just like that! I'm Kurt Gowdy, this is Paul Crispin. The fall with this beautiful weather today, both teams have good passes. If you're going to be a broadcaster, broadcast. And it's the first touchdown of the afternoon! If you're going to be 12-0 and it'll make me look like a genius, which I know I am anyway. No, they didn't. Oh, my gracious! Yep. How about that? You're Mr. Rice, Mr. Graham Rice. We saved ourselves. No, we didn't. All 80 Lux saved us. Ricky Williams lives to the Hall of Fame. Ricky Williams, touchdown! You know, if you want to be a legend in sports, all you got to do is win the big games once in a while and leave a lot of quotes. He's going for the corner. He's got it. Vince Young scores. The voice, like how they sound. Like you were we, made for this. Right, we sat at a, uh, we ended up in the same place with Maria's crew, and we were sitting at dinner at in Texas A&M, and Brent was talking, and I'm just, <laughs> like, I can't believe this is how you talk. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean you, like, you think these guys going on TV and they creating this whole persona, and he just sitting at the table just casually, you know, you know Marcus, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm like, hey.